Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a review of episode 893, Otama Appears, Luffy versus Kaido's Army. And look at least one of those things in that title is true. I personally wouldn't call two grunts of the Beast Pirates an army per se, but it's a start. Not that it really matters at all, because the anime has continued to deliver another all around great episode, which is insanity, because that's like two, yeah, count them one, two, two weeks in a row now. And it's quite shocking because when you look at it, this episode only adapted like 10 to 11 pages of manga material, just over half a chapter. So there was filler absolutely everywhere this week. But just like in the previous episode, they made it work for the most part. And take note any avid Grand Line Review historians out there, because this is the first time I've ever said this, and I don't know if it will ever happen again, but my favorite scene in this entire episode was 100 filler. And it just so happens to be when Zoro is fighting the Magistrate's lackeys, and he invokes one of the most glorious Tatsumakis we have ever seen. Anime original material in general has no right whatsoever to look this good, let alone an action-based sequence. And when you look at it, there's not really a whole lot to it. The animation isn't wildly complicated, but it sells the illusion fantastically. And just to zero in for a second on the action of performing the Tatsumaki itself, this is pretty much all I have ever wanted from an attack like this in the anime. It's so, so, so damn sick simple, but all I want with this particular move is to see Zoro spin. And if you look back at Tatsumaki's performed in the series, you'll notice that very few of them actually do that motion, which is a shame because it's one of those attacks that you really cannot feel the impact of without experiencing the generating momentum. Like if you took the spinning out of this episode, cut straight to Zoro's wonderfully stylized final pose, which I love by the way, and then experience the devastation to come, then it would feel completely unearned. And that's very much what has happened in previously animated incarnations of the Tatsumaki, like the fight against Kaku where there's no spinning, just one small motion, or even worse on Fishman Island, which was a travesty, where there was seemingly no motion at all. But what this brilliant success on Wano tells me is that this new direction of animation has a solid understanding of action. They know how to achieve proper impact through the importance of understanding everything that comes before it. And thinking of some of the fantastic action to come on Wano, I am very excited to see what they do with those scenes. And you know what? I'm also incredibly excited to see what action they just randomly decide to throw in along the way. Because if it's all going to be of this quality, then bring it on. To a lesser extent, this increased awareness of action is also on full display during the Luffy segments of the episode as well. And it felt particularly satisfying to see and hear his strikes against Kaido's grunts. And once again, it's all down to building proper momentum. The appropriate time and effort is put into Luffy's stretching motions so that by the time his attacks land, you really feel the force that was generated by them. It's so simple, but it's something that has very much been missing in the large majority of action sequences of the series for the better part of a decade. Probably more than a decade. In fact, another filler sequence I really enjoyed this week was Luffy dodging a bullet with observation haki. So in the manga, what happens is the, uh, the dude right with the gun lines up his sight on Luffy and then is immediately smacked in the head, which is powerful in its own right, as it demonstrates Luffy's incredible awareness and ability to engage in observation haki. But I have to say, watching him dodge the bullet was pretty damn fun as well. Also the conqueror's haki burst, wow, that was unexpected, because once again, not a thing in the manga. Luffy just glares at the baboon and then the baboon realized how hopelessly outmatched he is. But it was so very cool to see conqueror's haki activated on a sort of minimal warning level. I also really liked how they presented it. It looked and sounded right, nice and intimidating. Like you really do not want to mess with Luffy in anything even approaching him getting serious. And then I suppose we should also talk about a new character being Tama or Otama, I guess. I have a, a bit of a habit of dropping the O from many of these female Wano specific characters. So I'm more than likely just going to refer to her as Tama in these reviews as well. But I'm really enjoying her general aesthetic. Purple and green is always a solid combination of colors with of course some pink and yellow for a bit of fun deviation. And I quite like her voice as well. It's much less annoying child character than I thought she may end up. And also the shot of her engaging in her Kibidango abilities was just a joy to watch with all of the sparkles and the glowing dango and the sound, the sound was spot on as well. Another example of a very small moment crafted and presented to perfection. Something I was less sure about though was the whole sequence where Tama was running away from Kaido's lackeys. And to try to sell the illusion of running, the picture comes in and out of focus a few times. And uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure that I'm sold by this. I get the kind of idea that it's conveying speed by having them run so fast that the camera has trouble keeping up with them, but it didn't work for me so much, I guess. In fact, when I experience that sort of phenomena in the world of photography, it's usually because a still subject is just in such low light that the camera can't focus accurately. So if anything, I personally associate it with no movement whatsoever at all, but hopefully the illusion worked out better for most of you. Another thing I wasn't so keen about was the extended Luffy flashback. The flashback in the manga is there, 
but it's about a page long and it's very snappy and to the point. Whereas this episode sure did take its sweet time to move past it. I have to say though, it did start with a kind of cool segment, set to some fantastic Wano music with funky editing, but all around it just felt like it took far, far too long for me. And it's because of all of the randomly added things. Not the biggest of deals at all, considering how well the rest of the episode delivers, but uh, this wouldn't be a Grand Line review, anime review, without some criticism, eh? Something that very much intrigued me during the episode though, was a surprise appearance by a certain Basil Hawkins, via Denden Mushi Correspondence. So obviously this was not something that originally happened in the manga, and I do find it intriguing that they've chosen to reveal him at this point. I do get it though, because seeing a familiar silhouette figure like this helps to generate a bit more buzz about the overall episode, as opposed to the primary threat just being Luffy facing off against two random guy faces. In the grand scheme of things, I don't feel like it changes an awful lot. I mean, people went pretty damn crazy when Hawkins made his first appearance in Wano during the manga, but in the anime, he's already been seen loud and clear in the opening. So why not use a little taste of him here to really start to amp up the stakes of the beginning stages of this arc a bit more. Speaking of the opening though, I didn't talk a whole lot about it last week aside from the spoilers that it contained, and it's because I hadn't had enough time with it to form a real opinion, specifically on the song itself. So as for Over the Top, look, I don't think it comes anywhere near close to my favorite opening, but I can't deny that its high energy really captures the spirit of One Piece quite well. So while it is not something that I'd likely choose to listen to outside of watching an episode, it does very well to embody the series, especially with the superb animation that accompanies it. My favorite part is probably the very opening of the opening, with the whole one dream, one wish thing. I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing. Although I do find it a bit odd because it's such a dark way to start this opening with Luffy in chains and everything. And I mean, yeah, it has some nice metaphorical significance to do with fighting against adversity, never giving up, all that stuff, etc. But the first time I saw it last week, I was just like, well, aha, things got dark all of a sudden. But yeah, in conclusion, I like over the top in context. So what haven't we touched on yet? Ah, yes, all of the other filler in the episode. So a good general guide as to what wasn't in the manga this week was literally anything that does not involve Luffy's segment on the Kuri beach. All the fantastic stuff with Zoro was anime only material, as well as the rest of the Straw Hats, and I did not mind their portions either. My favorite bit was probably when we checked in with Frankie and he did his impression of Zoro Santoryu with planks of wood, which was an awful lot of good fun. He's still speaking slowly though, and a couple of commenters last week pointed out that the slow speech pattern thing with all the pauses is more than likely them trying to blend in with the inhabitants of Wano by speaking slow in a traditionally Japanese manner, which is fine, I can accept that. I just hope that it doesn't stick around for too much longer, because sometimes I feel like it really does kill the pacing of an episode. Usopp has a great moment this week though, where he burst into another splendidly told lie that managed to pull on the heartstrings of this, this man, who has no remarkable design whatsoever to his character. So even anime only watchers can probably tell that he's an original creation. He does have a pretty funny moment after he accepts Usopp's lie though, where he runs off to deal justice to Zoro and yells, hey, get out of my way. And it's just like, mate, there is literally nobody within like a 10 meter radius of you. Just a completely empty street as far as the eyes can see. So you may have overreacted just slightly there. And finally, I'm going to throw up a spoiler warning just in case for anime only viewers, because I don't think what I'm about to talk about is particularly huge. Um, actually, you know what it might be. So if you're not keen on knowing any future details whatsoever, then just skip to this time. But for the rest of us, Let's continue. This episode also gave us a glimpse of the Kozuki family, with probably the most detailed image of Odin we've ever received in the entirety of the series thus far. And just as when I first saw the silhouette in the manga, well, my immediately thought was, wow, that's one hell of a thick mustache. And yeah, yeah, I know, it's probably a mouth. Although who knows, maybe he does have a sort of Freddie Mercury thing going on. Quite notably, there was also a shot of Hiyori with her all important, blue hair. So I don't think it's going to take anime only fans long at all to put two and two together that Komurasaki is Hiyori. But one thing I'm hoping that the anime really does right is that when we get to this event in a year's time or so, that they expand on the chapter where Komurasaki appears as Hiyori out of nowhere with a completely changed personality and actually be somehow capable of making me believe that they are the same character. Because that's something that still doesn't sit right with me at all in the manga. Hiyori is presented as far, far too naive to be capable of achieving Komurasaki's sheer dominance and position on Wano, and I'm still waiting for a decent explanation on her. But finally of note is Lady Toki, the Kozuki clan member who I am by far most excited to see the story of. Her abilities intrigue me to no end, so it was a nice treat to see her ever familiar silhouette showcased here. But there's not a whole lot more to this episode. I have to say that this week really did the unthinkable and continued the brilliant changes introduced last week. It made me feel like Wano was going to have a seriously solid life in the anime, and I am actually looking forward to next week, as well as every subsequent week. Because knowing the kind of insanity that's to come in Wano, it is just going to be a real treat to see it all play out in the anime. But that pretty much does it for episode 893. 
If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the episode. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.